Dick Elsie, you're the chief executive of the HVM Catapult. Um, Dick, the Catapult, the high value manufacturing Catapult, is about just over 18 months old. Mm -hmm. um, it's well funded, technology strategy board, I think. Um, in total, something like £350 million. Pounds. You can perhaps correct me on sure, that. I will correct you on that, mate. <laughs> um, it, it, there are seven centres yep. um, na nationally distributed, involved in several different specific but also very broad areas of technology uh, access and development uh, in areas like uh, advanced engineering but also you know, le robotic laser welding. I think there's an electron beam welder that's mm -hmm, been delivered mm -hmm. to the AMRC recently. Um, and uh, add additive manufacturing, many other things. Yep. Um, now, could you just explain really for, for those who've not come across the catapult, what, what's its raison d'etre? Okay, well, in, 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 well it's, it's actually it's a global phenomenon about bringing new technologies to market. I mean, principally, there's uh, fundamental research which takes new concepts from first observed principles up to something which you know, mankind would recognise perhaps as a functional prototype. And then at the other extreme, you've got industry industrialising for large scale its, its products. So you take something like uh, lithium ion batteries. We've got we've probably got one on your, uh, your I, uh, iPad at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, lithium ion battery chemistry was developed in Oxford University. You didn't know that. No. And interestingly, the first observed principles were there. Uh, and it's now, there are billions of lithium-ion batteries all around the world. We're probably no more than a few metres away from anyone at any one point in our life. But those are made out in the Far East. Mm. And there's an example of a technology which was developed in the UK, which was, it failed to be grasped and commercialised in the UK. And the catapult is set up to grab those emerging technologies when they've got to a certain level of readiness or ripeness, if you like, and then with the help of government-funded resources take some of the risk out of the scale-up so it's ready for industry to grab. So we're basically kind of incubating mm. uh, promising new technologies through the manufacturing scale-up phase, mm. ready for industry to grab it and implement it. That's I mean, what we do. In your presentation, one of the headline case studies was, was Rolls-Royce. They mm -hmm. developed this uh, uh, advanced disk machining facility yep. with the help of um, one or two of the catapult sensors. And I think... Yep. The story is that they, they probably wouldn't have uh, developed that machining technology as quickly or as affordably without the help of the centre, making mm -hmm. it a very attractive proposition to man manufacture in the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but that's Rolls-Royce, and many people might think, well, surely this is just another uh, great government scheme to really benefit you know, the large companies, the picking winners thing, but it, that's not the case, is it? You're, you're no, 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 no. We're, he we're here to help companies of all sizes with, uh, with technology scale-up. I mean, for sure, the, the big guys uh, do cast a big positive shadow on the UK. And if, if you think about it, a company like Rolls-Royce will bring its suppliers along behind it. So if I take a look at Rolls-Royce, there's a long supply chain involved in the catapult scale-up mm. process. So they've got you know, right down to SMEs involved in that supply chain. But we, we also get to uh, SMEs outside of that mm. supply chain. I mean, a good example, which we've just talked about uh, today, is Barclay Plastics, um, uh, injection moulding principally, that's what they do, in, uh, in Birmingham. And we've been helping them break into new markets through the development of new manufacturing technologies. And they've just won some business with, uh, with Bentley on some new trim parts because we've helped them make a bit of a breakthrough on a new manufacturing process. So we do help mm. um, a range of size of companies. In fact, um, I'm be beginning to pull together a bunch of case studies of people we've actually helped who want it to be known that we've helped them, mm -hmm. and those are available on our website to have a, have a pick through. And the website's just recently relaunched? Uh, yeah, we've, had a, we've just, uh, uh, just launched a completely new website, which is hvmcatapult.com. Right. You get the plug in there, uh, and there's all the resources. You can, you can look at all of the technologies we've got in the seven centres, which range from everything from bio and chemical processing uh, at the Centre for Process Innovation through to final assembly, mm. robotic uh, automation. And I mean, just to give an example of the breadth of the capability, if I take the Centre for Process Innovation, they've got the capability of taking a biological process. So a university has developed a, in their labs a smart bug in mm. a test tube that can turn a wood pulp into something useful like an like a organic plastic. Mm. Right? It might work at a test tube, but there's a long journey from test tube to being fully industrialised. So at the Centre for Process Innovation, we've got the capability of taking that test tube scaling it up 250 mil, 1 litre, 10 litres, up to 10,000 litres, wow. nominally 10 tonne feedstock. And that's the bridge, if you like, from test tube, proven, it mm. works in a test tube, 
to 10 ton feedstock. And that's the point where industry is happy to take it as kind of ready to go. The industry wouldn't dream of grabbing unless it was something really exceptional. Okay. Okay. You know, they, they wouldn't normally reach that far back into the research base to grab that test tube and do something with it. So the catapult is about bridging bridging that gap. And the government money, and I'll, I will correct you, we, we mm. get over five years, and, so over 140 million over five years. So That's a, government funding. Government funding, just short of 30 million per year for, mm. the, for, the, for the seven centres. But in our first 18 months of operation, we've managed to leverage that. And because we've got the capability of doing stuff and making a difference in this space, we've drawn down a whole load of other mm. pockets of funding. So the Advanced Manufacturing Supply Chain Initiative, AMSCI, yep. uh, we've got projects running there. We're um, uh, already bumping into the sides of the building at the National Composite Centre. Mm -hmm. which does what it says on the tin, you know, it's all about... You're doubling the size of that. We're it, doubling it? the size mm -hmm. of that, so there's a 38 million, um, sorry, 28 million investment that's come in for that, and also a national biologics facility, all new, 38 million of government money behind that to mm -hmm. be matched by industry, and that's about grabbing another high-value business in the UK, which is smart drugs. Mm -hmm. So these are drugs that uh, are likely to be bespoke to you as an individual, which mm -hmm. demand a completely new manufacturing process. Mm. So it's not batch, it's not continuous, it's batch of one with all the disposables and something to go with that. So there's a whole new manufacturing process to be crafted. Mm. And the idea is by investing in that, we will embed those industries in the UK. And my firm belief after uh, eight or nine months in the job is the biggest anchor point for value in manufacturing, the high value in manufacturing in the UK is knowledge. Mm -hmm. The Rolls-Royce, one you just commented on earlier, is a classic example. Rolls-Royce have invested in the UK in a manufacturing facility driven by efficiency improvements from knowledge. It's not about the labour cost, which labour cost is important, but the thing that casts the biggest shadow of all, positive mm -hmm. shadow, is the knowledge, the manufacturing process that was developed. Interesting. And that, and by by articulating team. that knowledge through the CASPOR, through the TSB, through industry and in academia working more closely, by articulating that we can generate a more uh, compelling proposition to manufacture in the UK than we perhaps have done hitherto. Yes, ex that's exactly, you know, you've got it in one, that's exactly what we're about. And there are plenty of examples, I mean, is this, is this a unique model that the UK's uh, developed? No, it's um, just in my presentation I showed that there's been some European benchmarking. Um, Germany, with the Fraunhofer Institutes, have been at it not long after the, the Second World War, actually, so they've been around for a long time. You've got the TNO in, uh, in the Netherlands, VTT in Finland, all doing the same thing. Um, and so what we're doing is absolutely the right thing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a European challenge, not just a, a, a UK challenge, but we're perhaps a little bit behind the ball. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's never a, you know, a better time to, to start it. Also, I guess you're not coming from a, a standing start, because a lot of these centres were working... Uh, you know, very intensively on research projects before the Caspolt was formed That's right. about 18 That's months right, ago. Yeah. So you're sort of making the best of what was... That's right. And a key question I ask myself, are we adding, you know, myself and a small core team of, of four of us, are we adding um, a necessary value by bringing this group together? Um, and for sure, the first year results, I mean, we've had um, uh, 600 projects through the centres, uh, 431 industrial clients. Mm. You know, the case studies I've... I've talked about, and we're able now to grasp projects which span uh, not only different technologies, so we can bring together some, say, na nano work, nano fluids work that we're doing at the Centre for Process Innovation, and we're feeding that across into uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield. So we're using a new fluid to cool cutting metal. Because it's wow. yeah. So there's the interchange between the centres mm. of technologies, and we're also able to move now across sector because we're bringing the centres together where some, some may have a stronger automotive focus, aerospace, and we're getting that interchange. And it, it's getting better mm -hmm. each quarter. Talk about some of the amazing uh, kits that you, you've invested in at the different centres. We saw some on the presentation there, some giant-sized manufacturing assembly yep. uh, machines. What have you What have you bought recently? Oh, um, that's uh, just recently been purchased. And the, the really interesting one at the Manufacturing Technology Centre is um, a 20 kilowatt fibre laser. Now, you know, 20 kilowatts in terms of like domestic heating doesn't sound a lot, but when it's a laser, mm. that's a, that's a big deal. Um, and it's the most powerful industrial laser in Europe uh, on an open source basis. So uh, basically, we're giving companies access to that. 
uh, to help weld together in a very precise way with minimum distortion mm. some complicated bits. They may be automotive or aerospace, but it's about developing manufacturing processes using a very powerful, very intense local sure. uh, heat source to, to avoid uh, distortion and get better right first time. Now, now, you might say, well, a company, why can't they afford to buy one of those themselves? Yeah, but there's the rub, and that's this is where the catapult comes in. Is even a big company would probably have a challenge to justify, you know, several hundred thousand pounds worth of fibre laser to develop a process. What happens if it didn't deliver the results? Mm, yeah, mm, mm. egg on the face all round, um, and it, even more so, of course, for a smaller enterprise, it could bust the business by mm. embracing that. So the whole idea about the catapult is that with government support a piece of machinery like that is invested. The academic base that sits behind us at each one of the centres is, is helping understand how to get the best out of it. We've got the practical skills in the centre that, that can deploy that learning into a, in a physical industrial environment. And we offer that facility to a whole range of people to use. Mm -hmm. So suddenly you've got this pooled resource uh, and the government's stake in that has helped reduce the risk. And, and that there are the se several, sorry, several examples of that type of uh, high-end capital uh, capex where uh, several companies in a, in a group or in, in, you know, individually can access a, a, cap a capability which is just simply unaffordable. Uh, yeah, sure. Hands. I mean, the, the um, National Composite Centre, uh, we're investing, we've just put the orders in for a, a big uh, resin transfer press. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is about moving carbon fibre to a new production scale in, in, in timing terms. Because, you know, traditionally... Uh, Carbon composites are done in an autoclave in a vacuum oven. Yeah. So you get locked in the oven for several hours, and that, of course, that that's an impediment to high volume application. So anti-lean, really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, resin transfer press is a a big short travel press to squeeze uh, pre well fibers together and then inject resin mm. into them. So it's the kind of high volume uh, process, and we've invested in a very large. Uh, press which is going to go into the National Composite Centre, but it's going to be used by the aerospace guys because they're developing the technologies for the next generation of mm. aircraft. Mm. Uh, and the, the size of components that they're working on are remarkably similar to the kind of floor pan of a car. Mm. And the car industry in the UK, which is doing really well at the moment, um, the premium car industry in particular, needs to keep its competitive edge in the face of CO2. Mm. So it needs to take weight out of its products you know, we've already seen the, the new wave of aluminium coming through. Well, they're now beginning to look at uh, composite technology as well. So it's very interesting. You've got demand from automotive and from aerospace sharing the same piece of kit. And probably neither of them could have taken the punt and afforded the machine. Sure. That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're looking at um, OEM car manufacturers looking at composite technologies to manufacture body parts. You know, yeah, yeah. Body big, big bits. Yeah. Yeah. Not just little, you know. Sure. Uh, and that's coming on. That's happening right now. Uh, yes. The, well, well, the, the machine's been ordered. The, the demand's research. there, and yeah. we've we've got to match that demand. And that's, that's why, principally, the National Composite Centre has been mm. doubled in size to match that demand. Sure. So the fascinating thing for me is the demand is out there. This is, you know, sure it has to be sold mm. to make people understand what's out there and what can be accessed. But the industry pull for what we're doing mm. is quite extraordinary. It, it, it's yeah. greater because this is an interesting point. The the demand is very high, um, but Clearly, as an organisation like anyone, you'll, you'll have challenges. But at the moment, it doesn't seem that, that, that a significant challenge for you is to attract more customers. But they're coming naturally. Uh, yes, well, which each of the seven centres has its own business development people who mm. are naturally predisposed to grow their business. I'm you know, doing a bit of business development for the whole, the whole core. I'm taking on the responsibility of uh, pulling the team together to look at uh, you know, accessing European funds because mm. we've got Horizon 2020, the new wave of European funds, so we're getting connected, getting connected there. Um, but my biggest worry at the moment is our ability to uh, expand uh, to meet demand. Oh, so you know, we're yeah. bumping in, I told you about the National Composite Centre, Manufacturing Technology Centre in, uh, in Coventry, you know, with the demand it's at capacity, and we've got to find ways of expanding that facility, and we haven't got a... Mm. A clear route to do that at the moment, but we're working hard on that. Actually, quite a nice problem to have, really. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah it is. It is a kind of frustrating. And you know, I, I was talking to Lord Browers about how things were going. I said, on a on a good day, I'm I'm um, 
80% inspired and 20% frustrated. He mm. said, what's the frustration? I said, well, it's, it's this ability to expand quick enough, cause, which will need more government investment. And I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines sort of whinging mm. that there's not enough money. I mean, the fact is there isn't. Mm. Uh, and my objective is to really show uh, ministers who've, who've put the commitment behind this what we can do. And I'm trusting in logic and common sense to let stuff flow through from there. More investment from... Um, from the government and the science community? Th yeah, through yeah. The well, in principle, is it, this is about extra money. This is not about robbing the research base. Sure. Um, because we shouldn't denude that uh, at all. A, a, the a, research a, councils? A, yeah, yeah, we shouldn't mm. because we've got some of the best research mm. in the world from the UK and it would be the wrong thing to do to rob that uh, to fund the catapult. In fact, in fact it, would, it would lead to a, you know, a, an inappropriate competition for resources between the universities and the very thing we need mm -hmm. to grab that research and scale it up. So this is about new money. Uh, this is, a, you know, um, but the scale of the new money um, in the overall scale of the challenge mm. isn't, isn't that great. And I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, logic and common sense see through. Having said that, uh, government's been very supportive of some of its strategic industries it views as strategic. You heard... Uh, Lord Bros, uh, it was, no, it was uh, Michael, Michael, it was Michael Fallon that, okay. that announced the, well, it's already been announced, but the, the billion pounds for aerospace. So it won't surprise you that in that challenge for aerospace to develop the next generation of aircraft and engines and landing gear, all the stuff that we, we uh, manufacture in the UK, uh, they've got a billion pounds of government support to do that, which they're going to match. It's no surprise that some of the execution of that manufacturing will be done through the catapults. Yeah. It's interesting, when I first joined the, the, the job, um, having spent 30 years in, in industry, almost a feeling, oh, I wonder if this could be self-funding. Mm. That's it interesting. And I've now, after eight months, I've got completely the opposite view, mm. completely opposite view. And the reason for that is that if it became self-funding, it infers that industry is funding itself, it will naturally gravitate industry to more, more vanilla-flavoured technologies mm -hmm. that are safer, less risk. And so all that stuff I've just talked to you about, would industry go and invest in the fibre laser to have a go at it? Mm, not sure. So um, it's about sharing in that risk is really crucial. And the other really important thing is if, it did be, if, it, if there was a move to make it self-funding, it would make the centres be much more retentive with intellectual property because it would have a value to sustain their business. Mm -hmm. We're completely open with it at the moment. We're pushing out all this common learning that we do around the seven centres is being pushed out to industry mm. to add the value. So I've got completely the opposite view. And I think the, the government funding is so crucial mm. to that risk reduction and that openness, uh, which I think has acted as a real catalyst for businesses who see the centres as a, a neutral environment to, sure. to collaborate. It I mean, I said in, my, said in my pitch that we've got you know, two, two fierce competitors, Airbus and Boeing, uh, Airbus have just joined the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in right. Sheffield. Yeah. And you think, well, how does that work? Well, Boeing and Airbus would say, we compete on aircraft design, but don't necessarily compete on new ways of cutting metal. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's what they're sort of things that they're doing But together. that type of um, collaboration in an in in odd way wouldn't be possible without the government. Uh, no, cause it third, absolutely, because yeah, it does provide it that very neutrality. And... and Companies like to see some real skin in the game, and mm. it's not an awful lot of skin, really. Okay. <laughs> well said. In the overall scale. Then. Well, Dick Elsie, CEO of the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure.